in chapter 1 with the master-servant mentality, right? He began with how we, how we treat our servants, how we treat others, and how, Jesus, uh, how, how God is our ultimate master. Jesus is who we should serve. And then, then he began to uh, really crack down on how the, how the rich treat the poor and, the, and how the poor accept that and what that looks like and, and how, how we ought to treat others in, in, in those no matter where they're born, no matter what status they have. You remember he said if the man with money shows up and you give him the good seat at church and you tell the poor guy to sit at the back, which, I mean, most of y'all would rather just sit at the back anyway. I'm, I got that. I understand. But... But what, what they said was that that's no way, there's no partiality when it comes to our Lord. Uh, it reminds us that we are to not only be hearers, but doers of God's Word. We should not only just come to church and hear what the preacher has to say. Uh, you can't watch Joel Osteen for an hour on Sunday, turn it off, and continue to live like hell and say, well, I, I had my church today. That's not, what, that's not what James says. He says we are to be not merely hearers, but doers of the Word. Uh, he, he attacks how we should really approach and evaluate our lives of whether we are living God's way or the world's way and how easy it is to get sucked into the temptation of living and feeling the pleasures of this world while walking away from what God has for us and all that He has for us. And then last week we learned that prayer changes things. If you got a problem, you'll all solve it. Pray to God and He'll resolve it or something. That's my, that's my white rap song. Uh, if you didn't catch that, that's Ice Ice Baby. <laughs> things you'd love to forget in life. Um, and so we learn that prayer changes things and what prayer looks like. And as we close today, um, you can take these two verses, and if you just read them and take them out of context, it's easy to kind of uh, get lost in who they're addressed to and who they're uh, forced uh, at. And so here's what we want to do today. Um, James chapter 5, verse 19 and 20. We want to read it, we want to rightly divide it, and then we want to hash out what God has in store for our lives from this point forward. So James chapter 5, verse 19 says, Brethren, if any among you strays from the truth and one turns him back, let him know that the one who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And so a lot of, a lot of preachers, a lot of people will read that, take it out of context and and, and take it to us that we need to go, we need to evangelize, uh, because if we, if we lead other to Christ, love covers a multitude of sins. And, and, and so now if we, if we just go and do and we turn somebody from the error of their way, then God's forgiven me, He's forgiven you, He's forgiven everybody. He loves me, He loves you. We're one big happy family, right? And that's, that's what, that was my Barney reference for the day. Um, not many cowboy church pastors are going to reference Barney, but I just did, so there you have it. So as we... Uh, as we talk about this, we're going to see who he really writes it to. Because uh, we read this, that we're supposed to take the gospel to the lost world, and it's not uh, who he wants to. He says, my brethren, as he begins to close his letter and finish out, he, he addresses his brothers in Christ, those who know the truth, those who believe, that is who he's writing to. And he says, my brethren, if any among you strays, if any among you strays and we think and when i hear the word stray i think of you know gathering cattle and what do you call one that runs off he's a stray and you go and you you gather the strays and the one time i've actually been on a really big ranch and gathered cattle in colorado and we were we were drawn down off of twenty thousand acres and i don't know if you've ever been on twenty thousand acres that didn't have a fence or anything or i mean it it scared the tar out of me so i had some nylon saddlebags because uh, i'm a real cowboy and uh, i filled them up with like fruity pebbles and uh, I had peanut butter sandwiches. I could eat for a week off of what my poor horse was packing around, but I was scared to death to get lost because I had never been where you couldn't see a telephone pole. I mean, just nothing, and it was just beautiful. And so my, my buddy and I, Bradley Harder and I, it was his dad's man, it was his ranch, and, and we were in Gunnison, Colorado. And so Bradley and I, we strike out, and, uh, and we ride together, and, and his dad says, okay, here's the deal. You, we ride for about four hours, then we turn around and just start riding back. And he says, these guys that know the land are going to gather the cattle and push them down to you. And push them down to you, and as they push them down to you, you're going to drive, and you push everything to that mountain right there. And so Bradley and I went and did, and he goes, there's going to be some times where you're going to have to split up. And I said, no, that's not okay. <laughs> 
I'm not, I'm not going to ride alone. And so we went and we did. And I said, hey, Bradley, I'm going to ride over this little, this little ravine right here. And I thought, hey, that's cool. And, uh, and so I rode over that l- ravine. And as I rode, I rode, I rode, I realized I was getting further and further away from the only guy I knew within miles and miles and miles. And so we would holler back and forth because we were both big chickens. And, uh, <laughs> and we would holler back and forth. We gathered the cattle. And I didn't see Bradley for like an hour and a half. And you talk about getting nervous when he wouldn't holler back, you know. I think he was just jacking with me. And so, uh, and so we, get, we get them all gathered up. We finally get around the end of this ravine, gathering the points. And these guys are just, they're just sending cattle down. I mean, it's, it, there was 12 of us and 25 dogs, and they were just going nuts. And so we would just catch the strays, and we would gather and do, and then we pushed everything to the, uh, the back pasture. And so out of 1,200 head, we gathered up like 1,100 and uh, something of them. And so we, we, it was one of their best gatherings, probably because Bradley and I were so prepared and doing a great job. Uh, I don't know. But it was one of their best gatherings. But the second day, we go to gather the strays, right? When you go to gather the strays, you've got you to gotta look for those that, that, that weren't with the herd. Right? There was a reason they're not with the herd. There's a reason strays are strays, and they stand apart, and they don't do. And so the second day, Bradley and I, we got this figured out. My saddlebags packed a little lighter, not a lot lighter. Um, I had enough probably the last three days. And, uh, and, so, and so we do the exact same thing, except when we get to the end, Bradley's dad says, hey, very back corner of the pasture, you ride to there till you can see the fence, and you make sure there's nothing from there to the fence, and then you turn around and you do the same thing you did yesterday. We're going to have to ride a little longer today. We're catching the strays. And so you may have to help them guys get them down off the mountains and do And I'm going, this is not cool. This is like work. So Bradley and I set out and they leave us. And they leave us. We've rode four hours in, four hours to the back of the pasture. They leave us and, and, uh, they, and his dad says, all right, y'all just keep riding that way. There's a fence. When you get to the fence, turn around and come back. Well, Bradley and I rode another hour and a half and never saw a fence. And so we weren't sure if we were riding the right direction or whatever. When then we finally see the fence, and it's a ways away. It's another 45 minutes away. And we've already been an hour and a half, and we've left everybody else behind. And what if they forgot us? Right? What if they didn't care? And we saw four cows in the back corner. And we decided that our lives were more valuable than theirs. And I looked at Bradley. I said, did you see those? He said, no. I said, I didn't either. And we turned around, and we started heading back. <laughs> and we gathered all, we gathered another 70-something head that day, and we gathered all but just a few. And, uh, and, and, and it was a little rougher to gather the strays. You know, when they pushed them down off the mountain, they didn't want to come. There wasn't a big herd for everything to drive to. And so you kind of had to go get them. You had to force them to be part of what was going on. And we began to, we began to push, and that is exactly what, what uh, James is talking about here when he talks about strays. When he talks about strays, he's, he's talking about one who has wandered away. And when it comes to church and there are strays in the church, one who has wandered away isn't necessarily one who's never been part of the herd. This is written for those who believe. It's written for us who trust, who have been through and, and accepted the grace of Jesus Christ, but we have wandered astray. If anybody in this room says, I'm a believer and I never wander anymore because I have the hope of Jesus, I don't wander away, we would be lying to ourselves. He's not talking about the lost, wild, rank ones that have never known Jesus. He's talking about the ones who are part of a herd but who have drifted away. And what causes us to drift is many different things. Poor decisions we've made in our life where we don't feel worthy. Anybody ever feel like you just don't want to go to church because you just, I, I've done so much bad that it, 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 can't, it can't get no good. There's not enough good to bring the bad out of me. And we begin to believe that lie and so we don't go to church this week and then we don't go to church next week and we don't go to church the next week. And it's, it's so easy to get just to drift, right? And when you begin to drift, you begin to wander astray. And, and, and you know what sin is? It's a sickness. And you know what cows drift away from the herd? The sick ones. They isolate themselves. And why are they isolated? Because something is wrong. And so what James says is, My brethren, if anyone among you strays from the truth, if we're all honest in our Christian walk, at some point we've all messed up. We've all known the right choice. Not before. You can't expect those who don't love Jesus to follow His ways. 
We can't expect them to do what he says. But those who know Jesus, who love Jesus, and who know the right decision, but follow the ways of the world, and they step off into sin, they have stepped off into sickness, and they begin to wander from the truth. And a sick cow will draw away. They don't want you to get them. They don't want you to draw them out. And what are you trying to do? Do you want them to come out of isolation, out of the brush, and to be back part of the herd so you can hurt them? Is that what you want to do when you're trying to gather a sick cow? No. You're trying to do what? You're trying to help. We're trying to help that stray get back part of the herd. And that's what he says is if you have wandered from the truth, it is whose job to gather the strays? Whose job is it? It's ours. They belong to us. They are our strays. We may not have picked them. We may not have loved on them like you've loved on them. But they're part of God's kingdom. They're part of his family. And it's our job to go and gather them up. That is what God has called us to do, to gather the strays. And so those that have wandered from the truth, it isn't because they don't love God anymore. It isn't because they don't want to do what's right. You never know what's going on in somebody's mind. It's a slippery slope when we step off into sin. And I've said it before. If you're not running towards God, you're running away from Him. There's no level ground. And when you begin to not run towards God, you begin to slip away from Him further than you ever know till you realize and go, oh, crap. I should have turned around a long time ago. And you know what gathers that stray? You know what gets them back? The ones that have run from the truth? Somebody who cares enough to go get them. James says that if you... That's not that one. There we go. That was 420. It was not the right thing. He says in the second half, he said, And one turns him back. Let him know that he who turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul. He's not saving his own soul. He's saving whose soul? The stray. And he will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. And so as James finishes up here, he tells us that we are to gather the strays. The sick and the wounded within our own body of believers. We are to love on them, we are to go after them, we are to care enough about them to go get them and say, come back here. Proverbs 10, 12 says, Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. Hatred stirs up strife. When our brothers and sisters stray, too many times, it's a, it's, a, it's a cheesy cliche to say we shoot our own wounded, but it is true. In the Christian church, in most body-believing church, where love covers a multitude of sins, that's what, that's what 1 Peter 4.8 says, love covers a multitude of sins, but when somebody wanders astray, what do we want to do? We want to go, na na boo boo shame on you, look at me, I'm better. Look at me, I'm better than you. It makes me feel good when you screw up. Remember when I talked about, like sometimes in, in your relationship with your brothers and sisters growing up, you're like, somebody else screw up, so I look like a good kid for once. And too many times we apply that to our life with Christ. We want everybody else to screw up so that our sins don't make us feel as bad. And the Bible says that all sin, one sin, any sin is the same. And so we're all strays, needing gathered. But what happens is, is too many times in the church, is somebody messes up, somebody goes astray, and, and let's just address uh, what, what goes on in sin in people's lives, and we just like to go, oh, yeah, I can't believe you did that. And heaven forbid God put the big screen on our lives up and let everybody see, I can't believe you did that, 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 and that. Don't even go there. <laughs> right? And we like that idea because then it makes us feel better when others sin. Instead of love covering a multitude of sins and going and getting the stray, we just kick them while they're down. They say, go on, get. Fine. You don't want me getting you, I'm going to leave you in the brush to die. And that's what Bradley and I did for them four-headed cattle. 
Their life wasn't worth mine. Their life wasn't worth my time, wasn't worth my trouble. And you know where they found them four cows? Later that winter, they were in a helicopter just looking around, driving, you know, just hovering around and looking. And then four cows were running with the elk. And that's what had kept them alive through the winter and did. And then they knew where they were at. And they went up and gathered them. And uh, Bradley and I waited a few years before we admitted to the sin of knowing that those cows were in the back pasture and we didn't care. But, but yeah, so they... <laughs> So we knew those strays were there. And we looked at their life and said, eh, I'm more important. Me turning around and heading back towards the mountain they told me to was way more comfortable than going further that away, away from the mountain I was supposed to be going to. And that's what I want you to know and I want you to understand is, is as we look at others' lives, do we count them as valuable? When somebody's sick, just because they know Jesus doesn't mean they won't hole up and try to hide. When somebody's sick, they're going to tell you they don't want help. And I don't know, you may never battle with depression, and I hope you never do. But I know what the bottom of the pit feels like. And I know what living in a fishbowl with everybody thinking you ought to be perfect feels like. And it sucks. And all we need is somebody to love on us in the pit of despair like James says. To find that one who has wandered astray and to care enough about their life to reach down into the pit and go, Jesus says it's okay. Yeah, you screwed up, but guess what? It's okay. Because that's all we need to hear. That's all you need to, to know it's just to know that it's going to be okay sometimes. You don't have to have the perfect words to say. I'm no Bible theologian to pull you out of the pit of despair to go, hey, guess what? You come on down. What people need to know when they wander from the faith is that we still love them. Love covers a multitude of sins. And, and what the Bible says is that if we'll put forth the effort to go gather astray, that not only our lives are saved because we hope we have in Jesus Christ, but their life is saved. They don't have to wander aimlessly around all alone in the pit of despair with no hope because with knowing Jesus and a family of a body of believers who loves you, there is hope. There is hope. Hope for those who have wandered, those who have messed up. Jesus Christ, death on the cross, gives us hope. And that is what James is hounding on us about. Why does he tell us to focus on how we live? Because when we start messing up, we start running from God. And then we end up astray and God's got to come get us. So James just hounds on us week after week to watch our tongue, to tame our tongue, to pay attention to where we go, what we allow in our lives, to, to not be uh, concerned with whether people are rich or poor, but to love their hearts. And James attacks all of that because we need to know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. When we get away from that, it's a slippery slope and we can end up in a lot of dark places. I've been asked this question more, and that's why it probably means a lot to me more than it does you, so bear with me. In the last few weeks of, if someone commits suicide, do they go to heaven? Because I was raised in church, and the answer was no, is what people tell me. Because I wasn't raised in church, I didn't know the answer, I had to go look it up myself. I didn't just trust what everybody else said. Which would probably do us all some good if we would do that. Not just listen to what everybody else says, but go look it up and find the answer for ourselves. And the first time I was asked it, and I really had to dig down, it's because the first funeral I ever had to do for a man committed suicide. And it was my uncle. He's five years older than me. And he grew up like a brother. He was with us. He was the youngest of 13 children. And can you imagine? He never got in trouble because by the time Grandma got to his name, he was gone. By the time she rolled through everybody else, he was out of there. And she finally got to Adrian's name, and my uncle, um, he took his own life, and, and he was a believer and, and, and uh, lived in Amarillo and, and was raised like a brother to my brother and I. And so when he committed suicide, they asked us to do the funeral, my, my other uncle and I, and I, and I dove into God's word because I had heard, no, 
They don't go to heaven. And that's, God's grace is enough. And if a murder can make it into heaven, you commit suicide, you, you, you murdered yourself, you, you, God's grace is enough. And so uh, I, don't, I don't believe because I got to the pit of despair and believed that truth that, uh, that, that, that that was the best way out. I, I don't encourage that. I don't condone it. But does that mean they're robbed from all of eternity and not, not, not secure? I, I, don't, I don't believe that fact. But as I prepared, I did my uncle's funeral and I uh, had to do two in a row at my own church uh, about four years later and, and really began to wonder and battle with why didn't I help those men? What did I not do right? And as we looked at that, and as I studied, and I did, and I just, it, it, it burdens me. And you need to know that I screw up on a daily basis. On a daily basis. Just ask my wife and my children and, and anybody that works with me. But I have a passion to reach the strays. Because I know when they get to the pit of despair and nobody gives them hope what they'll do. And I don't want any more of that on my head. I don't want to look out across a lost and dying world and see forehead in the corner that are tough to go get and not want to go get them because my comfort's worth more. God has called us as a church to love on each other within the body of Christ and gather the strays. I don't want it on me and I don't want it on you. Because I know when I messed up there, what it did to me. And I needed a lot of help and a lot of prayer to get through that time in my life. And so as we close, James, and we think about all that we have done, I want you to know that if you are a believer in this room, and you feel like you have screwed up beyond repair, and you have wandered astray, you need to know that there is hope in Jesus Christ. There is nothing you have done that His love doesn't cover. And shame on us for making you feel like love will not cover your sin. That the blood of Christ wasn't enough. And those of you here who have never gave your life to Christ, there is only one way to know that you know that you know that there is hope beyond hope beyond hope. And that is to give your life to Jesus. Give your life to Christ because you can look around at a room filled with believers and, and we're all still pretty jacked up. But we're all doing what James has challenged and encouraged us to do to continue to live the right way and draw closer unto Him. The greatest thing about it is if God blesses us with 124 years on earth, will we be perfect at that point? No, we are continual work in process and so no matter where you're at, we can continue to work and improve. And so I just challenge you and I encourage you today that if you've given your life to Christ, let's get back on track and start running back towards Him. Let's not let anything hold us back. If you haven't given your life to Christ, let's turn around and let's do it today. Let's not wander anymore. Yes, sir. Can I say something? Uh, I, I'm, I'm new to y'all's church. My name's Earl Pitchers. And I, can, uh, I know exactly what you're talking about as far as depression. I'm 40 years old. Four years, eleven months in the penitentiary here in Pittsburgh. I was part of one of the most worst white racist gangs there ever was, and I've done a lot of things in my lifetime that I'm not proud of. And I deal with depression every day because of some of the things that I've done. This is the first church I've ever came to that you actually don't judge people for where they've been. And uh, I want to say that I know where you've been. I'm going through right now. I deal with depression. I deal with suicide daily. Because I have thoughts of suicide every day because of what I've done in my past, because I have to live with what I've done. So trust me, man, what this guy is saying as far as loving, don't just pick up this Bible and say that you're a Christian because you got more money than me or because you live a better life than me. This right here is the answer. Amen. Amen. He, let, Amen. He, he got me through so much stuff and so much pain that I'm dealing with today, still to this day, right now. That when you said that, brother man, it, 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 I know exactly where you're coming from. Amen. I'm going through it right now myself, but thank God, instead of going to get medication or trying to go to a sane asylum to try to get papers to say I'm crazy, God is my answer. Amen. God is my answer. Amen. And, and, and living as a Christian.
Amen. Let's pray. If you're here today and you need to know Jesus Christ, you've never given your life to Him. You need to turn and you need hope. I just want to give you the chance to do that. You say, Lord, I don't know all the answers. But God, I know I need you. Lord, I want to turn from doing it my way and I want to follow you. Lord, thank you for saving me. And that's what the Bible says we must do. Confess with our mouth that He is Lord and we shall be saved. But if you're here today and, and you struggle with where you're at in your Christian walk and whether you've done good enough or you, you battle depression, Lord, I, I, just, I just want to pray for you and say, Father, may we as a church go after the weak and the wounded, the strays in the body. May we not just let them wander off and, and, and into darkness on their own. Lord, may we love them. May we go after them. May we seek them and chase them like their life matters. May their life matter to us like it matters to you. And so, Lord, we just, we just ask that you would give us the courage and the strength to be that for somebody. Not to turn our head or to turn our cheek and go, eh, that's not worth it. Lord, give us the strength to do exactly what you've called us to do, to reach out to our brothers and sisters and love on them. And Lord, I just ask that if anybody's in the pit of despair today, they'd recognize the hope that they have in you. That taking our own life is playing, playing your job, that is doing what only you are called to do. You have numbered our days, not us, Lord. And may we trust in the fact that you will use us in spite of our faults, in spite of our failures, no matter where we go, no matter what we do. Lord, may you be the hope that pulls us out of the pit of despair. And Lord, and may we continually be set on your right track so that we don't have to wander astray anymore. Help us to focus on you and run towards you. Lord, we love you and we thank you for loving us. And we thank you for using us in spite of our faults and in spite of our failures to be part of your plan to gather the strays. Use us in a mighty way, Lord. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.